Greetings, everyone. This is Richard Solomon. The following show is a co-production of Taking Care of Business and Rocket Green Radio. So because it's Rocket Green Radio, we will have Antonio Sayant. How are you, Antonio? Good to hear from you. How are you? How are you, Richard? And our special guest is a very, very special guest, an important person to the world of sea life. Her name is Linda Booker. And uh, go to go to the web and check out strawsfilm.com. Apparently, there is so much plastic in the ocean that's interfering with uh, marine sea life that it, it's become basically a, a very great environmental challenge. Linda, welcome to the show. Thank you for doing what you do. You know, I, I yeah. guess when Dr. Seuss had um, the Lorax and the Lorax spoke for the trees, you speak for the turtles. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um. You know, I am Linda. I speak for the turtles. So, hey, how about the shrimp? <laughs> <laughs> so, Linda, what? Let's talk about the the whole problem of plastics in the ocean. I read on your yeah. web, website yeah. strawsfilm dot com. There's 500 million straws used every year around the world. That's just in one year in the USA estimate. Wow. 500 million just wow. in America. That's correct, and it probably is more than that. That's just an, an approximate uh, from some research that was done. As as population grows and restaurants open up, um, more and more, of course, will be used. And also, that's just in the USA, so if we don't even really have a, a gauge on the worldwide figure. And that's hopefully some of the research we'll have available when the uh, film is out. We'll have some of these things on our website that go beyond what the content we have in the short film to, to educate people about this issue. So how do the straws actually end up in the oceans? If I take the straw, I put it in the garbage, and it supposedly it goes to a landfill. Now, I know that's not good <clears throat> on its own, but how does it end up in the ocean? Well, you have just mentioned something, which is what we all should do if you're going to use a plastic straw, which, of course, we're sort of talking to people who are encouraging people not to use those at all. But you put it in the garbage. Unfortunately, right, right. a lot of these straws are don't, not ending up in the proper, uh, you know, waste can or, you know, in a, in a garbage bag. They're ending up either littering our streets or they are flying out of garbage cans or people are just, you know, being really, unfortunately, not thinking yeah. about it. And they're yep. just balls are flying out the window or they're leaving the cups out and um, you know the sources are actually surprising of how much marine debris ends up on beaches a lot of times it's not directly placed there or left on the beach they're coming um, washing down through uh, wastewater stormwater systems or they're actually coming into waterways through watershed systems inland so you know we well, see it yeah. I, I believe that I believe that, Linda, because you know, when I'm on vacation I you know, when I go to Aruba, you know, I see a lot of people with the drinks in their hand and they're in the ocean or on a boat. I'm on a boat and you know, and they throw you know I see them throw the straws into the ocean. I see people actually do that. You know, and that's one of the things that always bothers me, but we're talking about a huge amount of, of plastic. A huge you know, right. and and that's the thing that gets me. It, it must be somebody must be dumping it into the ocean. It, it, you know, uh, maybe people are, are in doing the landfill and are actually dumping it. And that's the only my concern. Um, are people actually doing that? Because we're talking about a lot here, not just a little bit. So. Well, we it's interesting. I, I actually attended a marine debris symposium here in the state of North Carolina where I lived last week, and they discussed a lot that there's waste management and there's waste mismanagement. Mm -hmm. Waste mismanagement certainly is a, con a huge con you know, contributor to this problem, but um, really a lot of it is personal habit use as well. There's also an issue with plastic straws that isn't, similar with a, with a lot of other single-use plastic in that mm -hmm. a lot of those products can be recycled. Plastic straws cannot be recycled. Why, so, why not? Is it just because they're too small or is it the kind of plastic? or it, it, It's both. So they're just not handled by any of the um, recycling companies. And 
So mm-hmm. unfortunately, they do end up in the garbage, or they end up just do. I mean, I can't believe <laughs> how many straws <laughs> I see now. Of course, I've become acutely aware of this issue <laughs> since I started the film, but. I bet now when you go out in the streets or you're you're walking around in your neighborhood, you're going to start noticing how many of those little guys are out there. (laughs) There's like, um, well, you know, you know where you see a lot of straws in all honesty, juice boxes. In all of those juice boxes with all the kids out there and all the, you know, nursery schools and pre-K and whatever, you see the juice box with the little straw that's in a piece of throwaway plastic that's adhered to the side of the of the box. So right. I'm and sure then, that's and a then big we have source. Plastic and plastic, which is even you know another whole doubling up of the issue there. Um, well, I gotta tell so, you, because of your film, I'll be honest. I go around restaurants and and all my friends that own restaurants. Uh, I I tell them that I give them advice, and they look at me like you know. And they said to me, "It's too expensive." It's now, too expensive to do what? To to change. Like I was talking to them about the bamboo straws. You know, why not do that? And they said, well, you know, Antonio, they, you know, we have a friend that does that in another country. And, you know, they're Albanian, so they're from Albania, you know, and uh, they said they, they own a, a, a restaurant nearby, and they, ha- they actually use that, but um, they know the guy who does it. But that if you bring it here to the United States, it, it, it costs too much money for a restaurant to, to invest in it. And I'm like, well, you're investing in the environment. You know, but a lot of people like solar energy, you know, they wait till the cost is down and then they, you know, they move on. And, and you know, that's what what people do these days, especially well, in New York. Well, let me, you know, I'm, where, I'm sorry. Let no, me ask ahead. this. How did the story actually evolve? Um, well, I, they, they, they've been around for quite a long time. Um, they were used, um, gosh, in fact, I have somebody doing a, an animation piece right now on the history of straws, and they definitely straws were used, you know, I, I believe by the Egyptians. Um, they seem to start everything, I think. <laughs> and um, that they were, you know, in the United States, I'd say straws, of course, didn't come along until I believe there was a um, influenza, and it was one of the reasons to sort of have something so people didn't touch glass when they were drinking, and so the paper straws were invented first, Mm -hmm. um, and then they became widely popular throughout, you know, the United States and soda shops, and certainly, you know, we've all seen so many images of, you know, everybody sipping their their sodas and their milkshakes through straws, but then, of course, the plastic ones didn't come along until, I think, the 70s, uh, 60s, 70s, and then... Yeah. You know, then we have all, this, of course, this emergence of fast food restaurants, and that, of course, is all about convenience and takeaway, and uh, you know, takeout food, and you know, it's become as these expanded, and now we have millions of uh, franchises. You know, you know you can, this is all adding to straw use, of course. Um, plastic straws, are, of course, cost less than any other kind of straw, and you brought that up, Antonio, when you mentioned bamboo. Um, when we've interviewed, uh, so one of the things I've done in Straws is I wanted to talk to the people who were on the forefront of this issue. And this does sort of emerge from the coastal regions because this is where people are connecting the issue to marine animal health or ocean health. And the kind of the first step they're taking with restaurants is just to get them to do one simple thing, which is to go to Straws on request first. Um, and it's sort of a, a, a thing that a business can do to reduce the plastic use. And that they find is that they're actually saving money right there because if you are using less straws, you don't have to buy as many. And they, they, that works. And what they also find is that really only about 10 to 20% of their restaurant customers or bar customers even use a straw or want a straw. A lot of times people just stir their drink and they throw it on the counter or they don't use it. Or if you don't give it to them, they don't really think about it and they don't ask for it. Is there a difference between plastic straws that you use to intake the liquid as opposed to the straws that you use to stir, like a coffee stirrer or you know, an alcohol stirrer, from an environmental point of view? 
Um, well, you know, plastic is plastic. And so, you know, there's sort of the saying that plastic is like a diamond, you know, it's forever. Uh, and it does break down over time, but it will take hundreds and hundreds of years for a plastic straw or a plastic coffee stirrer or a plastic toothpick or any of those things you find in bars to actually completely disappear. So, yeah, there is a difference in stirrers. I mean, when we're, we talk about straws, but, of course, in the film we'll touch on the fact that you do have all those little coffee stirrers and things, and we're finding those just as much. Um, and, and also, you know, the bars that use the little sticks. And, what, and again, as these uh, folks that are in some of these organizations that we're interviewing, uh, like Jackie, the last plastic straw in Santa Cruz, California, she's also talking to them about the alternatives for those as well. I mean, they can use wood. They can use um, uh, some fun things like pasta instead, uh, which is completely biodegradable. Uh, they can use um, the other bio uh, compostable straws, but there's a real issue there, and I do want to talk about that. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about it now. But we can, we can now is around. as good as any time is now, ever. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, we like to know. <laughs> so so really, the only truly biodegradable straw out there right now would be, of course, something that is plant-based, like a bamboo straw. But the one, of course, that's a lot more accessible and affordable would be paper. And uh, what happens, unfortunately, with the, quote, compostable plastic is... Uh, Antonio, you mentioned, you know, they're kind of brittle. Um, people sometimes don't like that. They're, they're brittle or they melt in, in higher yeah. heat. You leave a, one of those biocompostable cups by a heat source or a plastic straw, it's going to get um, probably melt a little bit. But that, that, that is the, they're made to melt. They have to be dealt with in a high heat compost facility. And the issue with that is that we just don't have a lot of those actually accessible in most municipalities unless you go to somewhere like you know, San Francisco or some other cities around the country that have those. They just end up usually in a garbage bag, too. And really, so it doesn't really do any good if they're in the middle of a garbage bag that's sitting in a landfill. And you also have to think about the materials that are going, you know, into those, which might be corn, and that's all. You know, right. you can really go down a rabbit hole looking at energy use into all these alternatives. But right now, it seems like, especially for a business, a restaurant, that the the best alternative at this point in time would probably be uh, paper. Um, now, the other thing, we, though, we are trying to maybe get people to think about is, well, how about just bring your own, you know, how about have your own, bring your own straw, or at least at home, you know, if you have kids or you want to use a straw, uh, how about you use something that you can use and reuse? <laughs> and, of course, those are words that we hear a lot when we're talking about green or eco products. But there are beautiful glass straws out there. There's a lot of people making them, and they're really high quality. They're, they're very strong and durable. There's steel straws. Uh, you can throw them in your dishwasher. They come with these great little brushes to keep them nice and wow. clean. So there is, um, I've seen you know, the, I'm, I love going on the Instagram now because all these companies, you know, we're all hooking up on social media and it's so fun to see the different alternatives that are coming out, including a straw straw, <laughs> a straw literally made from a straw plant. So that's also would be, I'm sure, a, a nice alternative. I think I saw the steel straw at an ice cream shop. Really? Well, I, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I'm seeing them more around. In fact, I have a friend who is an operations manager for some nice high-end cocktail bars in New York, and they're using steel straws. And we visited a restaurant in Costa Rica, and she ordered 300 of them for her restaurant to use. So it is it is happening out there. But it's you know like a lot of these changes, it, it takes some time. Yeah. Take, take, Let me talk to you about uh, the, actually. You mentioned Costa Rica, and I don't know what. What what town it, it's from? But there was a, a gentleman there. He was a, he was working for the Harmony Hotel, and he you know he's like fifty one, and and uh, he what turned him on about the whole thing. And this is the funny thing because he's a security guard, and he's walking around. and He was in charge of the gardens of that hotel, and then he saw a lot of people throwing away the plastic straws, literally throwing them in the ocean, throwing them in the garbage. And then he, he said, well, you know, my father's a farmer, and he has all this bamboo, and I wonder if it would work. Instead of using 
the plastic straws, let me convert it to bamboo. And that's what he did. And then he presented to the hotel, and they loved it. And now they use it. And here's the thing. He's no longer a security guard. And what he does is now, that's what he does. He consults, and he goes around uh, to all the hotels, and that's what he's doing. And everyone is doing this. And so, it's uh, remarkable. I, I find that amazing. I, totally we, amazing. we have to take a quick break. This is a very okay. fast segment on radio. Keep it locked right here. This is Richard Solomon, Antonio Sion, and Linda Booker. Strawsfilm.com. We'll be right back. All right, Richard Solomon, welcome back to Taking Care of Business and Rocket Green Radio. You are listening to Richard Solomon. Thank you for being here with us. Antonio Sayant from Rocket Green, rocketgreen.com, and Linda Booker, who's a filmmaker. And uh, you can see her latest project at strawsfilm.com on the web. Uh, before we kind of go into sort of the whole bamboo thing, uh, while people are just coming back from the break, uh, Linda, tell us a little about sort of the, the film fundraising and all that other good stuff, some of the behind the scenes. And I think you have some pretty famous people uh, involved in narrating and that kind of thing. Um, sure. Well, uh, th- it's interesting how I came to even this topic because I have a lot of people come up to me, you know, a lot of documentary filmmakers will get suggestions from their friends or colleagues or, you know, people they're talking to. A lot of times even in a Q&A, people will be like, you know what you need to make a film about? <laughs> and, you know, we get a lot of topics thrown at us. And, and you know, we, when you make a film, you have to really decide, do I want to get myself into this topic? Because usually it takes a while to get these off the ground, you know, through fundraising, through the production process. So you have to really want to feel some passion and interest in it. And, you know, the last the film I made before this, Bringing It Home, took me about five years to finally get it out into the film festival circuit. So so when somebody comes to me with an idea, you know, I have to really you know, kind of bite my tongue sometimes. But, I, but this idea came to me from a colleague of mine at the Sonoma International Film Festival. And he had seen Bringing It Home, my other film about industrial hemp, and really liked it. So we, we kind of, you know, we kind of got along a lot because he's really into the protection, environmental, uh, you know, issues, and he lives on the water in L.A., and he was seeing, you know, a lot of this kind of plastic litter on the beach, too, firsthand, and he just happened to casually throw out to me, hey, you know, this is, I have a great topic for you for a short film, and I said, oh, yeah, what's that? And he said, straws, and it was so interesting because... I honestly, I considered myself to be so eco-conscious and you know, sustainable chick. And here I had made this film about industrial hemp, and I'm at Green Festival and talking about all these ways to be greener. And that never even occurred to me about plastic straws. I never had thought about that before, but I instantly was gravitated to the topic, mainly because I thought, wow, if I hadn't thought of that, that means that a lot of other people haven't really thought through this use of single-use plastic either. Right. And then, so, mm-hmm. yeah, and so I, then I kind of dove into the research mode and, and started started looking into it. And I found uh, a woman in Santa Cruz, California. Her name is Jackie Nunez. And she is the founder of an organization called The Last Plastic Straw. And I was really interested in her story. And she ended up being kind of one of our feature pe- people that we feature, you know, t- have met we meet in the film and she's been an inspiration for a lot of other people around the country in their efforts to curb plastic straw use and i have to thank steve shore again for connecting me to ed begley jr Um, they both have worked together on certain efforts in the los angeles area on environmental issues and he uh, was out did the outreach to ed and got him to come on board but i really was so grateful for that and Ed had seen Bringing It Home, my other film as well, and he liked it, so I, hopefully that helped. <laughs> yeah, did, did, it's, fun, it's funny you mention Ed because, you know, uh, Rob Butler from the, the Green Festival, he contacted me uh, a, a while back, like it must have been like a year ago, and he asked me if I knew him. I go, no, I don't know him. And they wanted him to speak, and I said, well, uh, the best way to do it is to get 
you know, in touch with his press people. And I connected my press person uh, to give me names of his press person. And, I, and, and then next thing you know, I heard he just spoke in L.A. Oh, he's a very, very he's very big in, 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 in the environment. He would show his uh, wife, I believe, you know, and they both spoke, I think. So going back to what Antonio said before about his friend, the bamboo guy, because I wanted to mm-hmm. link all that back in because that was really interesting. Linda, did you did you meet sort of unique individuals like Antonio's friend, the bamboo guy, um, who are trying to make inroads on the issue? Yes. Yeah, so we talked to a few people who have done initiatives or campaigns here and in Costa Rica around plastic straw use. Um, I mentioned Jackie. Uh, she started hers in 2011. And we also found through me sort of following uh, the story about a turtle in Costa Rica that had been rescued with a plastic straw in its nose. Uh, through that story, I ended up finding an 11-year-old little boy that lives in Playa Grande, Max. And when he found out about that turtle, he was so moved and wanted to do something to help turtles and help other animals in the ocean be protected against these encounters with plastic litter. Mm. And he started his own challenge, and and he was able, through an engineering class in school, to convince the teacher that they could make bamboo straws and they could take them out to their community in Costa Rica. And he now has spoken to over 40 restaurants and coconut vendors in that area and you know, gotten them to commit to either doing straws on request or changing over to a different kind of straw or using like bamboo or paper or metal. And he's just such an amazing little kid. And it just goes to show you, even a child can make a difference if they are feel, you know, strong about something and it comes from their heart. What about six pack rings? Because I know that that's also closely related as a as a as a hazard and it's it's actually like a almost a choking hazard as well yeah they've been a problem for a long for a while now and i think a lot of people that that's a vision there's been enough i think photos and and images of animals that have gotten those you know stuck around them and they actually the you know there was actually there's a horrible photo of a turtle actually that was stuck in one of those and the shell is like cinched in the middle where the ring has been all its life. I think there's a lot more awareness around that. I mean, most people now that I know, at least, they kind of either cut them up before they throw them away or they make sure they dispose of them properly. There's a, there's a brewery, I believe, now that is making an, a bio, fully biodegradable six-pack ring from, I think, the leftover hops or the barley that they, they brew with. So that's very cool. And <laughs> that's a great idea. That, yeah, it is. Idea. Now, the, more, the more innovation and engineering we can put behind trying to make a safe single-use plastic or, you know, there's a lot of ways to attack the issue. Certainly the reduction of use of it, the reduction of manufacturing of it, but certainly using engineer, you know, innovation and engineering to come up with something better that's less harmful to our environment and animals and also ourselves. I mean, we can get in a lot, you know, a road of talking about just plastic and the chemicals in it and our interaction with it and how that affects our health. I mean, I really do think about, you know, you you mentioned the juice boxes earlier. You know, people are putting plastic into their children's mouths and not even really knowing what that's made of. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, we can only do so much in a short film, but... We're going to do some fun, lively segments with animation, and it's great to have Ed on board to do the narration because we want to really entertain and educate at the same time. So we'll be doing a minute about this history of straws, and we'll be doing a minute about what exactly are you sticking in your mouth when you put a plastic straw in there. Well, before you talked about how long it takes for plastic to break down, but plastic as it is, what does it actually break down into? Because I can't imagine it's good if it ended up in water and it, it ended up in drinking water. So what it breaks down into is what we call microplastic. And this is a pretty hot topic right now in environmentalism. Microplastic is something that it doesn't go away. Um, it just breaks down into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. 
And in our film, even though we're talking about one particular plastic item, we said we, we, we are going to definitely kind of try to hit on and segue to the larger issue of all of the marine debris, um, plastic litter that's out there in the oceans, and particularly that's gathered in the gyre system. Um, a lot of people kind of have, they've at least heard about the, the great garbage patch in the Pacific, and we kind of... I was really excited about some of the interviews I've gotten us for this film because there is a little bit of myth busting that we're doing in the film, which I think will enlighten some people about what that actually is when mm. we talk about those plastic gyres. Um, it's what's not a, what's a gyre. A gyre. A gyre is a, a circulation giant circulation system of currents that encircle the planet, basically. But these, there's sort of a uh, um, oh, not vertigo effect, uh, kind of, you know, a, a circular vortex effect that happens in certain areas and in the oceans. And this is where this plastic is sort of through the currents ending up in these vortex areas. And so we there's then miles around these vortexes that contain a great majority of these plastics and microplastics. So a lot of research is happening uh, with a lot of the marine biologists around with a lot of organizations that are, you know, looking at this and trying to do, you know, quantify exactly how much is there, how much of the inputs are coming from land and where the sources are. And what we interviewed uh, an amazing researcher, Janet Jandek, who uh, teaches at the University of Georgia in Athens, and her and her research group have been able to come up with some pretty staggering numbers of plastic that we have now that's going in and what we're looking at in the future if we don't start to make some changes. If we don't start to make some changes, then what's going to happen to us? Um, well, what the sad thing is is that we, we're now looking at seabirds. 90% of them have plastic, have ingested plastic. Um, if you were paying attention a couple weeks ago, President Obama was able to expand the marine park um, around Midway Island in Hawaii, near Hawaii. And right, right. Yeah, and it, um, you know, of course, you know that news probably didn't make as much news as Trump or, or Hillary Clinton, you know, stopping somewhere and combing their hair that day. But um, you know, it's just we need to. <laughs> You know, unfortunately, no one's paying attention to some of these stories, but the albatrosses there are bringing tons of plastic garbage to that island, and they're feeding it to their baby chicks because they're not able to differentiate the plastic between some of the, the seafood that they feed their chicks. And wow. these chicks starve because their their stomachs fill up with this plastic, but, of course, it's not food, and they just end up dying from starvation. That, that sounds absurd. unpleasant and painful. Well, it's it's sad. I mean, they're not the only animals. They're in, uh, turtles now. They've estimated about fifty six percent of the world's turtles have eaten plastic, and that's only able to determine from the turtles that they're able to find after they've already died from it. I mean, we don't really have a, a perfect number on that, but it is too high. So so why aren't these issues out in the forefront? Well, that's one of the reasons I'm making this film. Uh, I think that, you know, this is an overwhelming issue for, it, it's a huge issue. And I think by making a short film that talks about one object that, I think everybody can think about and maybe make a change about. It's not that you know, it's not that difficult to to kick the straw habit or to do an alternative to it. And then that can maybe lead to people thinking about the other plastic they have in their lives, or at least be a little you know a little bit more mindful about it. But of course, we need businesses to get on board, and we need the co you know we need everyone to cooperate in this effort. Yeah, but you know what really bothers me, and I'll, uh, I'm just going to be honest with you, is that I, I come across a lot of people that manufacturers that have that you know have like the plastic water bottles and stuff, and a lot of them say, "Hey, you know, well, we recycle them," and I tell them, "Okay, uh, what are the machines that you use to recycle them? What what's the energy source?" And they tell me electricity, you know, and I said, "Well, is it solar? Is it?" wind power, and they go, no, we have a real machine. I said, well, here's the thing. 
you're spending a lot more energy recycling plastic. And you're not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And it's not. Uh, and I always tell them, like, you know, when I walk around the Green Festival and I was a, a brand judge, I there's one guy who's making these toys, you know, and he said the wood was, you know, recycled. And that was great. I, I love that idea. And then I asked him the one question that he couldn't answer me was the paint and the machinery that's, that's done to make these toys. And it's not sustainable. So... You know, there goes that. And he couldn't answer that question because he was uh, afraid to to do so. So a lot of these places that make these materials uh, are not. That to me, if it's run by Seoul, a lot of the production companies now, uh, like look at Apple, for instance. Apple has a whole facility that's run on solar. So, so uh, eventually, I'm hoping that that's what will happen. But until then... Um, a lot of times when, yeah, I'm making these straws, uh, it's recycled plastic, um, I'm helping the world, but technically you're not because you're wasting more energy. Well, you know, that's like, that's like all those people out there, they have the nickel deposits, right? And they save up all their nickel deposits in the big bag, and then they go back to the, 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 the store. Right. But they spent you know, $7 in gas to, to return $3 worth of deposits, um, which yeah. which is why a lot of people just end up throwing them away, which is also another problem. So now, now one thing I, I want to bring up is something that I remember one of our first conversations between Antonio and myself, and we only have three minutes left to go in this segment. But I remember Antonio gave me a staggering statistic about the number of water bottles used in the making of a motion picture. Could you, in two minutes, just... Remind our listeners what that was all about. <laughs> well, the whole point of it is when a company comes to me and, and I see these trucks and it says, uh, you know, going green, sustainable, and, and then all of a sudden I see these uh, plastic bottles and I, I went and I did my own research and stuff and then I find out that um, the one motion picture, 55,000 plastic bottles are used, you know, and in a motion picture. And that, to me, alerted me. And I said, oh, that's absolutely absurd. You can't have that. I mean, what's going on? It's the same thing with paper. Why are we using scripts when we still have, we have the iPad now? And it's because the actors are so used to having a script in their hands. They don't feel like they're, you know, being creative or, you know, they can't connect with, you know, the iPad. You know, and that's the thing. And, and I still see it. And it bothers me. It bothers the hell out of me, actually. You know, but, you know, uh, uh, that's where I'm there for. And a lot of people, like you, Linda, and so on, to spread messages like you do with your film. And hopefully that people get it. You know? I, I yeah, you have something interesting with the plastic water bottles, which, of course, you know, I really try to never use unless I'm really in a situation where I don't have an option. Um, and, it, and, you know, and I think people just have to change how they're doing how they approach this. I'm for the first time actually having a scene where I'm going to have extras and I'm filming it next week in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. And I decided, well, what can I do to at least show some small example that we are trying to be more environmentally friendly, especially since we're doing it behind the blockade runner beach resort, which actually hired an environmental coordinator. I mean, hotels just don't do that. <laughs> and so they're no. wonderful. They're using paper straws. They're, you know, they, really has stopped using those little individual jams and jellies and plastic, and they're doing it what they can. And the one thing I didn't want on there on that filming time was any plastic water bottles. So in my, you know, in all my uh, promo that's going out to get these extras, I'm saying, bring your own water bottle. You know, the hotel is wonderful. They're going to put out big coolers of water for everybody and, you know, just to get people to bring their own water bottle. But if you don't start talking about that and getting that message out and letting people know, hey, this is kind of, you know, you're being the cool kid when you do that as opposed to using the plastic water bottle. Um, my other issue with that's something that's come up that we're hearing a lot about are <laughs> plastic water bottles that are getting recycled and made into fabric. <laughs> and yeah. I think... The, the, this is sort of a greenwashing thing, but mm -hmm. 
now we're reading about how so much plastic fiber gets into our water system through us washing those synthetic clothing. And that's something that does not get filtered out of any municipal water filtration system. That's going straight into our creeks and streams and ending up in our oceans. And that's another form of plastic that all these fish and seafood that we love to eat, they're all ingesting that. And plastic hasn't really been around long enough to know what happens when we start eating it. But I can't imagine it's good for us. I will hold, <laughs> okay. so, hold, hold on. Yeah. We, have to, we have to take a break right here. Keep, okay. keep that thought. Keep that thought. It was Richard Solomon, Linda Booker, Antonio Sayant. We'll be right back. All right, greetings, everyone. Richard Solomon, Taking Care of Business, Rocket Green Radio, co-production here. We have Antonio Sion, engineer, environmental in, environmentalist, and, and, and someone with a very good soul when it comes to saving Mother Earth. And then one of the protectors of our planet, Linda Booker, who's actually going out there and educating people about the dangers of certain plastics in the environmental ocean cycle such as straws so check out her film strawsfilm.com but she also has done a, a movie took a long time to put that one together on hemp let's talk about hemp for a little bit because um for a long time hemp was just completely outlawed and you couldn't even get like hemp cereal or just you know <laughs> hemp clusters even though they had no psychoactive ingredients and uh I think you couldn't even get like a hemp blanket or something like that. And you had a, I, I remember going to Canada a long time ago and you were able to buy like, you know, T-shirts and, and clothing that were made out of hemp or hemp rope or things like that. And and I remember like, wow, you know, it's sustainable. It's, it's, a, it's a good product. And yet they won't bring it in to the United States. I'm like, but this is clothing. <laughs> I mean, this is clothing. <laughs> so I, I know that we have some very antiquated ways of thinking but george washington from what i understand was a hemp farmer so where did we lose our way uh well so thomas jefferson well back back in those days a lot of things were made from hemp so it was the fabric instead of cotton it was the fabric of their lives back then it uh was used in all the ropes and the sails and the canvases and ships it was used as oil in their lamps so it had a lot of use, so it was being grown, and and it was actually, I think, uh, you know, required, I think, in the Commonwealth of Virginia to actually grow it. I, you know, there's a lot of great history behind that. Uh, and what happened was around the turn of the century, we had other crops like cotton and that were coming along, and that was actually being probably more subsidized with money as far as the machinery to process it and, so cotton sort of took over from hemp in a lot of ways. And then, of course, then synthet synthetic replacements came along, and that also killed the market for it. But then there was, of course, a, a the tremendous issue of conflation of hemp, industrial hemp with marijuana. And I think that's still the stigma that really is the biggest block and barricade for the United States to fully legalize it as a crop here, just like it is being grown in Canada and in about 51 other countries around the country right now, um, around the world right now, we did make some progress with um, an amendment in the Farm Bill that was passed two years ago that allowed the states here to grow pilot research crops if it was done by an educational institution or their departments of ag. And the only state that's kind of been taking exception to that is Colorado because they just decided, well, we're going to do it all and we're going to, you know, they, their legislation included industrial hemp with their marijuana growing laws. So that's the only state right now that's sort of letting farmers go about and grow it on a larger scale crop like our neighbors to the North Canada. Now, of course, you can buy all the hemp products you want here. <laughs> uh, no problem finding hemp clothes, hemp cereal. You can walk in the Whole Foods, buy hemp seeds, hemp oil. It's incredibly nutritious. It's been declared a superfood by Dr. Oz, and, you know, now it's not quite... Uh, it's becoming more and more, you know, I think a familiar product, hemp milk. and But it still is really a shame that we are not giving our farmers the same opportunity to be on the economic playing field as all these other farmers around the world. 
And I'll quickly, I know this is a topic I can talk a long time about, but just a few days ago I saw that there is a huge supply of hemp seed, um, shortage of uh, supply of hemp seed now for all the Asian countries that are becoming very interested in this in a nutritional product. And the Canadian farmers cannot meet the orders. So wow. there's a market. Yeah, there's a market for it, for sure, and, and, and American farmers could be a part of that. But Does day by day, the laws are changing. There's new, new states passing legislation on it. And, and finally, here in my state, in North Carolina, we hope to be growing some research crops next year. What is the difference between hemp and marijuana as far as bot a botanical structure? So industrial hemp, uh, you know, as, as, as pointed out before, has a very, very trace amount, three-tenths of a percent of the THC chemical that is the, you know, the, the chemical component of marijuana that gives you the high or the buzz. Uh, so if you eat a bunch of hemp seeds, you know, no problem. You're not going to catch, you know, any trouble on your drug test or anything like that. You know, you don't need to worry about it. You're not, you can't smoke your hemp t-shirt and get a buzz. And God knows we've heard every single joke under the sun around that. But um, but what it, the actual industrial hemp plant, if you look at a lot of the crops that are grown, it's very tall, it's very skinny, kind of, it looks like bamboo. It's planted very close together so that it creates a lot of shade, which in turn actually eliminates the use for a lot of pesticides, um, I mean herbicides, because uh, the, the weeds just don't really grow in these crops. As opposed to if you start looking at either marijuana that's grown indoors or even outside, they're, they're tend to be shorter, bushier, like little Christmas trees. So there's a structural, um, there, there's, there's certified varieties of, of industrial hemp. And I think alone there's hundreds of them worldwide that are registered varieties. And these varieties are, are developed specifically maybe for fiber use or seed use or both. Wow. They should, they should do a show called... Uh uh, hens growing pains, <laughs> something like that. Because you know, you know, in certain look in Indiana, didn't the governor, uh, uh, the one run, running for vice president, actually, uh, uh, Governor uh, Mike Pence, Pence, is that his name? Uh, he actually legalized uh, in the state of Indiana that um, you know he signed a bill. Uh, I believe it was uh, a law that he, he signed last year. But still, in, in certain parts of the state, you're not, you still can't grow it, uh, uh, the crop, you know. So I don't understand that. It's legal in Canada, Europe, China, uh, and a lot of other places. Um, and also, I, I met a gentleman, and I can't remember the name of the company, but he, he said to me, you know, Antonio, you're looking for hats and shirts, uh, and it was all hemp products, you mm -hmm. know. And <laughs> I was looking at that, I said, what? You know, and I was just laughing because uh, I, I didn't actually I didn't know that you could make hats or shirts out of it. You know, and it's very interesting. That's all. Well, very, very interesting. Here's, yeah, here's here's the thing that it makes that I had no clue until I happened to open up USA Today in October 2010, and I saw that the nation's first hemp house had been built in Asheville, North Carolina, and wow. here was this. You know, young designer standing in front of this gorgeous modernist style house, right out of the pages of Dwell magazine. And I thought, wow, that's incredible. And then went on to find out that not only what this is a carbon neutral building product that can actually absorb toxins and carbon out of the air continuously over time, and it's mildew, mold resistant, pest resistant, fire retardant. It's incredible, and it becomes an entire wall system, so you're eliminating a lot of that nasty pink fiberglass ins insulation and sheetrock that, you know, it, it, that's what I hope becomes an industry in the United States that can really take off. I think it's going to be a while, but it's one of the most amazing green, innovative product building products out there right now, and the healthiest. And not like that, but think of all the jobs it would create. Well, you know, and restoration and renovation uh, or, uh, is a huge industry. I mean, that does create a lot of jobs. I think in New York when they retrofitted the Empire State Building, it was thousands of jobs were, you know, created around that. So um, hemp is an amazing product that could be used for a lot of uh, 
that use that would support a hemp industry in the United States. And along with that, a lot of the European cars use hemp fiber in their um, baseboards and the, the wall panels because it's, it's a, the strongest plant fiber on earth. So right, it's, right. It, and, but it's very lightweight. And so we know that the lighter the car is, the less fuel use or energy use it'll have. And I think about, my God, what if we could grow this industrial hemp in the United States and our American automobile manufacturers start using it? And again, supporting the farmers and the industry here. Right, but isn't there a, a, a control substance act? I think it was 1970 that, that uh, actually it included hemp. And and that's why they they in their minds they schedule it as uh, as a drug and and uh, that's why it was uh, made uh, illegal to grow in the United States. That's uh, correct. This, yeah. yeah. So there's a there. So what there is a Senate and a congressional bill called the Industrial Hemp Farming Act, and right. what that would do is declassify it or take it out of that um, you know out of that I'm sorry that policy. And finally, redefine industrial hemp for what it actually is and not a nar- narcotic. So what we – and this is the main thing that is the biggest barricade still is it is still classified as a drug when it's not. Well, I read somewhere that the industrial hemp is legal to grow in more than 30 countries, but the United States is still, you know, hesitant in doing so. So, you know, it's like – Little by little, so it's kind of hard that thirty countries, but the United States uh, is like pulling teeth, you know, when it comes to that, and and uh, it's just uh, I don't know, it's 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 hard to to believe that they officially they won't one hundred percent they won't do that, you know, and I I, I have no problems with it as long as uh, hello, yeah, we're all here, yeah. we're all here, everybody's here, oh, okay, we're uh, listening intently, yeah, I I just hope that. You know that they 100 percent they go for it because I think it's a great idea. You know, I really do. So well, and in the South where I live, you know, we 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 have a, a history of growing crops like cotton and tobacco, and a lot of these, you know, have a, a very large environmental impact through the, the the herbicides and pesticides that they use. And not to mention, you know, mon- monoculture is not really good for soil health and. Hemp is a great rotational crop that requires very little input, so it just has a very low uh, impact as far as the crop, and it's easy to grow. I mean, like all plants, it might need some fertilizer, a little help now and then. It's not completely a perfect disease-free or, uh, plant, but what, when, I, uh, when we went up to Canada and, and went to one of their conferences, you know, we learned so much about you know, just what the benefits are just from growing the plant for soil health and for um, just also it can absorb toxins out of soil. So they've actually used it at some nuclear accident sites to absorb radiation. Of course, in that case, you would not want to use the hemp, the hemp for anything after that. But it's, it's right. pretty incredible. Um, you know, I, I encourage people to go check out the film. It's called Bringing It Home. Um, and we're at bringinghomemovie.com, and you can watch it on Vimeo On Demand, and it will soon be on Amazon to watch as well. So wh- how did that movie arise? In other words, we heard the great story of how the straw film started, but how did this movie come about? Uh, well, I have to uh, thank or blame. I'm not sure now. I've got to thank my friend Blair Johnson. Uh, she is, we met at the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University. We were both... Uh, involved in uh, or in, enrolled in their certificate of documentary studies program there, and we were like the bad girls in the back talking all the time. <laughs> she was she was always kind of talking about hemp to me. She was really excited and passionate about it, and uh, for a couple of years, talk you know really wanted to make a film and was trying to get me on board. But I was a little resistant, I think, because um, hemp sort of has this reputation as being a miracle plant and. Yeah, I'm kind of skeptic, a little, little cynic about things like that. And although I have to say, over time, I did my own research, and I did come to find out that there, it is a tremendously beneficial plant in so many ways. And especially when I found out about the healthy home construction, I myself have connected the dots and realized that I was sick and got asthma from my new house. 
I didn't even know what was happening to me. It was all those new things that were off-gassing that were affecting my body and making me sick. And I, a lot of people don't realize that. And it just impressed me that this was a whole new construction material that could be so beneficial for our health and the environment. Well, you know, the thing is to get the building industry to, to get psyched because it may be cheaper, healthier, better. Um, you know, there's something called LEED certification for the people out there who are um, environmentally aware. And I actually have friends and clients who are involved with things that are, you know, green building. And I'll, I'll probably off air introduce you to some people who may be able to help you with the hemp drywall to the next step but but that's you know we only have a couple minutes left so but that's 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 the networking we'll do after the show which is sort of the power of the show because you know people like you know i met antonio and then now i've met you and then we met amy greason and she's a botanical uh medicine hunter kind of person and one thing leads to another it's all really really great because it, this platform rocket green radio is such a great uh, mechanism to find environmental people in fact uh, one of our co-hosts on the show with Amy Greeson, who is a pharmacist, was a woman, Susan Sachs, who is a acupuncturist and Chinese medicine practitioner. So there was like a, a nice little synergy there. In, in the time that we have left, which is only mm, two minutes, uh, what are the future projects that we could look forward to hearing and seeing from you? Oh, my gosh. I haven't really thought about the next one yet. Uh, I'm, I'm still in production on straws, and I hope to wrap that up by year's end and get it out on the film festival circuit in the spring. And then, you know, it'll be available for educational use, but I'm, I'm trying to cut a shorter film of about 15 minutes to 20 minutes. And then after that, we have so many amazing interviews with incredible people, you know, researchers and just activists and uh, restaurant owners in California and here in, um, on this coast and Costa Rica and, you know, I, I really want to, we can expand to a greater film. We also have Dr. Wallace Jake Nichols, and he's really well known in, in um, marine conservation circles, and, and cut a longer film then that would be available for educational use. So this, this is going to keep me busy for a little while, but I look forward to that part of it so much. It's really about getting it out in front of the people, going to a place like Green Festival or the film festivals, doing these community screenings, or talking to college kids, and just really having a conversation around the issues that we're talking about um, in this film and, and hopefully some change and some awareness comes out of that. You know, we're not saying all plastic is evil. And I mean, there is good use for plastic in the world. And a lot of our people talk about that in the film, but what we can address is what are the major things that are littering our beaches that are getting into the oceans? How can we do a better job? And how can we just all be healthier and happier and greener in the end? All right. Well, that's well said. And that's it for this show. So my special thanks to Antonio, because you always find some of the greatest guests uh, to interview. And you always bring a lot of great content. And Linda thank Booker, you. thank you for the incredible effort that you undertake uh, bringing your passion to the screen. And, and, well, making us, and making us aware of issues that really have a tremendous impact on our lives and the world and in our future. So thank you for that. This is Richard Solomon. Thank you for listening. Stay green out there. Keep well. We'll see you in a week. Mm -hmm.